Good evening. Thank you for joining us today for our study as we continue in studying 2 Timothy. Today we'll be talking about the subject of how Christians should treat one another. Now notice I said Christians. And of course, if we're treating Christians good, we should be treating everyone good, right? Well, let's uh, open with prayer and invite God's presence into our study tonight. And if you have needs, please share them with us. If you're wa uh, watching online, let us know what your needs are. And we'll be glad to pray with you and pray for you. Well, let's just uh, invite God's blessings upon us today. Father, we are so thankful to know that we can cast all of our care upon you for you care for us. Us. And we realize that we are living in difficult times, but compared to many in the world, we are so, so blessed. And we thank you for every blessing. But the greatest blessing is that we know you, know the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. So we ask you to minister to us tonight as we look into your word. Touch those bodies that need to be touched. Give encouragement with encouragement is needed. Strengthen those and heal those bodies. And God will just thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love relay races, especially the 4x400, four the last event in a track meet. Most times the winner of the track meet depends upon this race. And the excitement is so great because at the end of the race, it not only ends that race, it ends the track meet. In this relay, it's made up of four segments or four legs of the relay, each one running 400 meters, so roughly running a quarter of a mile. And each one of those that run that segment, they run it to the best of their ability, but then comes a very, very important part. They have to pass the baton. They have to give the baton to the next runner because they can run no further. Their leg is over. It's time for their race to be finished. In church life, we must realize that the church is much bigger than one generation. Paul's generation was getting ready to close. He was getting ready to, we find in just a few chapters later that He'd say, I fought a good fight. I finished my race. I've kept the faith. But before he finished, he had to pass the baton. And that race would still be going on, but his personal leg was finished. But he had to pass the baton. It's much easier for us to understand Paul's letter to Timothy when we remember he was preparing Timothy to take the baton. His life was soon going to be over, and he was getting prepared to pass the baton to Timothy. As we remember studying last week, he said to stir up the gift. Timothy, you be ready for run your part because it's getting ready to happen. Now, the reality was that Timothy was already running his race because he was already leading the church at Ephesus. But he was telling me, you got a race to run, and so, Timothy, I want you to be Prepared. I want you to be prepared for that race. Now, we know that many times we must learn from experience. But I heard something the other day I don't think I've ever heard before. Said if we learn everything but from experience, we don't have that many bones in our body. <laughs> that if we have to learn the hard way, chances are we'll never learn them all. So we need to learn from other people's experience. And that's what Paul was, was telling Timothy. Early in my adulthood, I remember a phrase that was very prominent back in the late 60s and early 70s, and that was there was a generation gap, a generation gap. And we know that there's an idea that every generation's different, but my professor at college kind of summed it up best when he said there's really no such thing as a generation gap. It's an experience gap. See, that we that have been through it, we're looking back on it, those that are coming into it don't have a clue. So Paul was telling Timothy, okay, this is what's coming up. This is what you need to be prepared for. I'm sharing with you because I'm getting ready to pass the baton. Possibly the key verse in 1 Timothy is found in chapter 3. We've already read it, but I want to reiterate it as we look into our study tonight. 
where he says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. He said, I want to prepare you. If I don't get to see you personally, if I don't get to uh, minister you personally, I'm writing you this letter. So this was the purpose behind this letter to Timothy. And of course, since it's included in scripture, it was not just for Timothy, but it's for all of us. And he was telling Timothy, I want you to prepare yourself to run your race. Now he said it another way. He said, I want you to study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. But did you catch that? He said, I want to teach you how to behave in the household of God. Now, some of you probably had a mom like I did that when you went to church, you learn how to behave in the household of God. You learn how. If you didn't, you would get that look. And you know that that look was not something that you wanted to go beyond that because the next thing to follow the look, I'm going to talk to your dad when you get home. And you did not want to hear those words. So we learn how to behave within the church service. But Paul was talking about more than just the church service. He was talking about our general relationships one with another in the church. And so that's where we're at today as we look at chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, where he gives us instructions for the church. Amazing things that all of these instructions are talking about relationships, relationships one with another. We need to understand that the church is not the building. The church is the body of Christ. And remember, Timothy was actively involved in the leadership of the church at Ephesus during this time frame. And so a lot of the things that he was addressing to Timothy, and we covered this last week, was things that Timothy was, was encountering during his pastoring or leading the church at Ephesus. What was the main problem at Ephesus? Well, there were several problems, but one of them is lack of unity. One of them is friction within the church. And it's so amazing uh, that the church today thinks that 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 should be part of our church life. But Paul says, no, Timothy, I want to teach you how to behave. And part of that behaving is even being in leadership. Remember, we talked about that already. But let's look at these scriptures where it says, do not rebuke an older man, But encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in purity. Then he says, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. What was he saying? He said, we need to treat one another, in the words of Jesus, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And he says, for an older man, if you have to rebuke him, he wasn't telling him you can't correct him, but how did he say, do it as a father? Do it as you would do to your father. And if we have a right relationship with our earthly father, even when we get to a place where we disagree, we disagree respectfully, we disagree honorably, And in today's society, it seems like we we got the idea that nobody else has the right to a different belief or a different thought process. Listen, folks, we can agree to disagree and still love one another. And we need to understand that that's what uh, Paul was telling Timothy. He said, Timothy, I'm getting ready to leave this baton and you've uh, got to endure it for a while. And while you're running this race, there's going to be some people that you don't really like. There's going to be some people that's going to give you a rough time. There's going to be some people that you as a leader are going to have to learn how to deal with, but you do it the right way. Remember what I've always said. There's no right way to do the wrong thing. So as we begin to look at needing to correct, he says, if you need to, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him. In other words, in the ministry, You may know someone that's older that doesn't have a whole lot of education, but he spent his life serving God. And even if you have to disagree with him, you disagree with him as you would a father. A man of respect, 
man that you love, a man that you courage. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I think you get the gist of what we were saying, that all of this goes on and talks about how to treat widows, how to treat people in the church. It even goes to say, and I'm not reading that scripture, but if you read that chapter, it says that if we don't take care of our own families, that we're worse than an infidel or we're worse than an unbeliever because we do not assume our responsibility. One of the things that's greatly lacking in our society today is no one wants to be held accountable. No one wants to assume their own responsibility. Even in the church, it says if there's a younger woman, we should treat them differently and understand that they're capable of remarrying. If they're a widow, they're capable of carrying on with their life. And they're not to be treated on the same manner as an older widow that cannot do it for themselves. We need to accept our own accountability and our own responsibilities and be willing to do them. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy to get ready because I'm getting ready to pass the baton and you need to understand how to treat one another. Now, if we went back and looked at the book of Ephesus, or Ephesians rather, at the church at Ephesus, we would find that a lot of the issues that were going on in Ephesus, he tells us to have unity in the body. He tells us that there are different parts of the body, that there are different ministries in the body, and we need to have respect one for another. And I realize today, it seems like, particularly in the political arena, that you say, well, you, you vote differently than me, so I can't agree with you on anything. Folks, that's the wrong attitude. That's not the way to build cre- and create unity. That creates division and hatred. We need to understand that we can agree to disagree and to go on. There's some things that I'm never going to agree with you on theologically. There's some things I'm never going to agree with you on uh Politically, there's some things uh, as far as the, what we eat and how we do things. We're going to disagree. But let's agree to disagree and still love one another. Then we come to a scripture that, a passage that I, I really don't like to talk about. Because uh, it tells us in verse 17 of that chapter, it says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. I've always had difficulty with that double honor because, see, I'm one of those elders. I'm one of those ministers. I'm one of those teachers. And I never consider myself being above anyone. So why should I be worthy of double honor? Well, it goes on to say, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out grain. And the labor deserves his wages. What's he saying? There's a lot of people in the world today and look at the church leadership and say, well, they're making way too much money. And possibly in in some instances, they're correct. But the ox is worthy of his hire. This scripture, I come to realize a number of years ago when I was going through a severe financial crunch. I was struggling financially and having difficulty uh, making ends meet. And I did not think that I deserved more money from the church. I did not think I was worthy of more money from the church. But as I was praying and asking God and, and trying to continue on my ministry, I understood this verse a little better. I understood that if I was so concerned and weary and fearful of not being able to feed my family, then there's no way that I could adequately prepare to feed my church body spiritually. And so I begin to understand that that's why they're saying, it does not say that a minister is worthy of double pay. It means the fact that his needs need to be taken care of so that he would be able to minister to others. And so that, that kind of freed me up in that passage because, you know, I've worked a lot of secular jobs. I hear the comments, well, the only thing the church is after is my money. And I realize that there are those in every aspect. There are doctors that are after your money. There are mechanics that are after your money. There are many people that are after your money because that's what they live on. But the reality is there are many people that are doing the job that God has called them to do. 
and they're worthy of their hire. When you think of some of the great men in the ministry and people say, well, you know, they make thousands and th hundreds of thousand dollars a year. They could probably make a hundred thousand dollars a year doing many things because of their giftedness and their capabilities. So let's not begrudge somebody making a good salary. I hope that I've covered that well enough because like I said, I don't like to talk about it because I realize that uh, our life is a lot more than what we live on and our salaries. And then it goes on again where it says in verse 21, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without pre prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Now, what had he been talking about? He talking about life within the church. We do not need to prejudge. We do not need to show partiality. The book of James that we covered recently talks a lot about that, that we need to treat one another equally. And then he says something else. Do not be hasty in laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. Sometimes it's easy to jump on board somebody's bandwagon. It's easy to jump on board because that's popular. And that's what everybody's doing. That's the fad. But let's be careful, even in church life, that just because it's done within the realm of church does not necessarily mean that it's doing good. That we need to remember not to take part in the sins of others and to keep yourself pure. And as we covered last week about Timothy, he said, Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. It seemed like with everything else, Timothy had some physical ailments. And what was Paul saying? He said, Timothy, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. I think one of the most difficult things in the ministry is sometimes we don't want to take time to take care of ourselves. And maybe some of you are the same way. I know for wives and housewives and mothers, the last thing you do is want to take care of yourself because you've got so many other things to do. But we need to take care of ourselves. Because remember, you're getting ready to pass your baton. Regardless of your age, we don't know when the end of that race is. And you need to be prepared need to get the next generation, need to minister to those. As we, we didn't spend a lot of time when it talked about the different generations. Ladies, you need to be mentoring young ladies on how to live a godly life, how to be godly Christian wives, leaders. Men, we need to be teaching the younger men. Why? Because they're the ones we're going to give the baton to. And if they've not been trained, Let's just go back to the analogy of running that four by 400. For those of you that are not familiar with it, the 400 is basically a sprint. It is one of the hardest races in track because you have to run almost wide open. And if you're not prepared for it, if you're not trained for it, the old saying in track is when you get around two-thirds of it or three-fourths of it, that that gorilla is going to run out there and grab you because you have not trained for it. Now, I hope you understand that analogy. What we're saying is if you have not trained for it, you won't be able to hold up to the finish. So this is a challenge to each of us, challenge to those of us that are older to help prepare those that are we getting ready to the hand of baton to. It's up to you and I to teach the younger generation how to live in church how to agree with one another without being hateful, how to love one another even if we disagree. We're preparing them for the work of the ministry. Why? Because sooner or later, ready or not, we've got to hand off the baton. We've got to get rid of it because our life, we cross the finish line. So we need to be ready to pass the baton because the race it's not over. Maybe over for us as individuals, but it's not over for mankind until God says it's over. So be prepared. Pass the baton. Get somebody ready to take your place. Lord bless you. Thank you for joining today. I want to pray with you. And some of you are struggling today. I understand that. And I never want to close a study without prayer 
and being able to pray with your needs and pray for you. Regardless of what we study, I understand that there are always needs. There's always prayer requests. So I want to close today praying for you and praying for your needs. I encourage you to cast your care upon the Lord. He cares for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love. And we ask you to show yourself mighty. Show yourself strong on behalf of these, your people. And God, teach us the truth of the lesson today. That we can live in unity and live in harmony without being in total agreement with one another. We can have our differences of opinion and still love one another. And help us also to realize that this race, each one of us is a unique race and that we're going to have to finish our own race as Paul did. But just as Paul did, he handed the baton off to Timothy. Let's be prepared to hand it to the one that's prepared to receive it and help us to prepare those to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining. Lord bless you. Have a great and wonderful day, and we'll see you next week.